Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, everyone. My name is Krista Brown, Training Specialist with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, Trauma-Informed Supervision for APS with Robin Pendleton, Senior Staff Development Training Specialist for APS with the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. And I will be formally introducing Robin in just a moment. Next slide. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide. As many of you know, the APS TARC works with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. We are here to help APS programs in any way we can. So just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. Next slide. You may not know, but the APS TARC presents monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, managers, and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other about the issues and concerns facing APS programs today. The calls are held the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of each month, depending on which peer group you would like to attend. Registration information is sent via the APS listserv each month. Please email us if you're not a listserv member and we would, um, we'll go ahead and um, get you registered. Next slide. Okay, now some housekeeping. A handout of today's slides is available for download in the handout section of your webinar control panel and you may download them at any time. Please adjust your computer speakers um, and use those computer speakers to access audio and make sure the volume is adjusted to your desired level. If you experience problems during the podcast, we recommend that you go ahead and sign out and, and re-enter, log back in. Next slide. We are planning uh, to have time at the end of the panel presentation for um, questions and comments, but uh, you may ask, may ask questions of our presenter at any time. In fact, you may be prompted to answer some questions using the questions box in your webinar control panel. And at the end, we'll try to relay as many questions as we can to the speaker. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the TARC website at a later date, along with a copy of the slides, and we will let everyone know um, about that and all registrants. And everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. And when prompted, please go ahead and take that brief evaluation survey. We love hearing from you. All right, so let's get a sense of who we have on with us. Next slide. I am going to go ahead and pull up a quick poll and launch it. Okay, which of the following do you identify the most with? So what in this field that we have, is it adult protective services professional? Is it other social service professional, medical professional, legal professional, or other. So we'll leave that open for a few seconds to get a sense of who you are. Okay. Leave it open a couple more seconds. All right, gonna go ahead and close it now and share those results and surprise, surprise. We are predominantly APS professionals here at about 85% with other social service professionals. Welcome everybody and legal professionals and a few others. Thank you so much for being with us today. Another quick question, uh, next slide please. 
Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Robin here, but while I am doing that, one more quick question. What are you hoping to learn from this webinar? Go ahead and type your answer into the questions box, and I will go ahead and introduce Robin, and he will get started with our presentation. Next slide. It is my great pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Robin Pendleton is Senior Staff Development Training Specialist for APS with the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. Robin has been employed with the state of Missouri for over 18 years, working first with the Department of Mental Health and now with the Department of Health and Senior Services as a training unit supervisor for Adult Protective Services. He has a over a decade of experience training employees in many topics focused on providing trauma-informed person-centered care. Robin is also currently the co-chair of the Curriculum Development Committee for the National Adult Protective Services Association, NAPSA. And now I'm gonna turn it on over to Robin, take it away. Thank you so much, Krista. That was a very nice introduction. Um, you guys earlier, Krista, said that you might get prompted to put more answers and stuff in the questions box. That is true. I will be asking you guys to share, and I am looking at your answers coming in about what you're hoping to get out of this training, and I hope that I answer several of those for you. Um, as you guys are putting in what you would like to learn, I have another question I'd like you to answer along with that one. Um, how many of you with your organizations are already trauma-informed or in the process of becoming trauma-informed? Uh, I'll be watching your answers coming in. <clears throat> so first off, let me thank you guys for joining us today. I think it's, it's so exciting to see how many people are showing up for this topic and wanting to learn more about how to, to better supervise our staff and in turn take better care of our clients. Uh, it, it's an honor to to have been asked to do this informational piece for you, and I hope that I can answer all these questions you guys have coming in. There's so many. It's awesome. Um, so to start it off, let's let's talk about what trauma-informed care is in general. Trauma-informed care is a practice that you put the person first. We we try to look at trauma as kind of that universal precaution, if you, if you will. We don't know who has a history of it and who doesn't. So we treat everybody as though they may have a history of trauma. And we also acknowledge that some of the things that we're seeing with that person, things that we may call symptoms, they're probably adaptations for somebody else and for good reason, and something that makes them feel safer or more in control of their life, and we see them as a problem, but they're their solutions. Trauma-informed care also resists re-traumatization. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, a couple slides from now. And what I mean by that is we try to not traumatize people both with our interactions, but also with our words. Now, there are some principles to trauma-informed care that I do wanna introduce, as well as the five core schemas on the next slide that will take precedence of over all the slides that we're gonna talk about today because to talk about trauma-informed supervision, you have to have the principles of trauma-informed care taking place as well. So safety, emotional and physical, trustworthiness, collaboration, peer support, empowerment, cultural and gender issues, all of those are the core principles of trauma-informed care. And like I said, they're gonna to be touched on throughout this entire presentation. The five core schemas, safety, trust, esteem, intimacy, and control. What does this mean for our staff? And this is where I'm going to start turning it towards our employees rather than our clients. Do our staff feel safe? Have they had assaults? Have they had threats? What about COVID? COVID and other um, infectious diseases. Is that causing concern for our staff? Is that causing them to feel unsafe going back out into the field still? Um, what about job security in itself? Uh, you guys may have heard that, that phrase that's being coined out there right now, the, the great resignation. 
people are leaving jobs left and right and finding new jobs left and right. So what does that mean for the ones who are sticking around? Do they feel safe in the job? What about trust? Do they trust the clients? Do they trust their coworkers? Do they trust their supervisors? Do they trust management? It doesn't take a whole lot sometimes to break that trust. And it becomes really hard to gain that back, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, what about esteem? How do they view themselves? How do they view how they're being valued in the workplace, the work that they're doing, the people that they're caring for? Again, another piece that, that comes into play for this is intimacy. And oftentimes if I say intimacy, people ask me, well, what does that have to do with our staff, if I'm a supervisor and I have to look at my staff, well, I'm not getting intimate with them. Well, no, you're not getting intimate with them in the sense of like a romantic relationship. But if you look at what intimacy is, that's the closeness between people. Those relationships, do they feel comfortable around the people they are, they are with, whether that be their coworkers, their supervisors, or their clients. And then the last one here is control. And a lot of times with trauma, Control is one of the things that they lose, and it's really hard to get that back, and we see a lot of the adaptations because of that sense of control. How in control are our staff feeling, their work life, their careers, their ability to even tell you no if they don't feel safe, if all these other things are being threatened as well? So here's a question for you. What does this mean for our staff that are experiencing trauma? Share your thoughts. I'll be watching the question box as I, I go on, but I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. So trauma-informed supervision. What we're looking at here is supervising staff who experience trauma. It's a tool that helps you look at compassion fatigue, secondary trauma, burnout, all those things are happening to our staff every day. Uh, Trauma-informed supervision also promotes resiliency and that ability to bounce back and grow and get stronger in their job. And it supports both the client and the worker. Now, I will, will say that I've been watching the comments coming in and some of you said that yes, you've already had some trauma-informed care training. You've already had some of that stuff taking place. And some of you are saying, um, not a whole lot, but we're getting there. So right now you're probably thinking, well, do we have to become trauma-informed at our organization before we can even start exploring trauma-informed supervision? And honestly, you guys, my answer to that one is no. My answer to that is it's never too soon or too late to start looking at trauma-informed supervision. And honestly, if you started with trauma-informed supervision, you're not starting from a deficit. You're actually starting from a point where if you're focusing on your staff, they're going to be apt to put that same core concepts of that in place when they're working with their clients. So don't feel like if you haven't already become a trauma-informed organization, you can't start looking at trauma-informed supervision. Um, again, we take better care of our staff. They take better care of our vulnerable population. And I'm seeing the, the comments about the staff being affected by trauma. Yeah, it's, it's an absolute, absolute. Um, let me ask you this one too. What's the difference between a worker and a client? I'd love to hear some thoughts on this one. You know, oftentimes we say as a staff person, we're the professional. And as the professional, we shouldn't be susceptible to a lot of the things that our clients are going through. But if you look around, whether that's in your own life or with your coworkers, uh, the people that you maybe you've worked with in the past, there's a fine line sometimes between the things that we try to assist with, with our clients and what we have ourselves or within our coworkers, our colleagues. We wanna support both. And we can't support both if we don't acknowledge that our workers are also experiencing trauma. Yep. And I see somebody said they're the same. They just have different roles. You're absolutely right. So 
So that trauma-informed approach to supervising, we have to follow those principles. And again, you guys are gonna get this as a handout, so you'll have all these principles in case you, you don't know them, but you'll have those principles. We have to recognize that there are symptoms that are adaptations. I kind of touched on that a little bit before with our clients, but we have to recognize that. And we have to also recognize that secondary trauma is not a when, it's an if. Um, so when not an if, I'm sorry, we're going to experience it. That's the name of the, the game here. We're going into some of the most vulnerable situations that we could possibly see. We're experiencing the traumas and you have to admit that that secondary trauma, that vicarious trauma is being absorbed by our workers. Maybe not day one, maybe not day two, but that stuff starts to build up. We also need to make sure that we're supporting staff right away and we're not making them wait for a set meeting. I know a lot of places have weekly, bi-weekly, monthly scheduled meetings with their employees to talk about their caseloads, to talk about things. Support them right away. If something has happened to them in the field, if something has happened to them um, on the job, in their personal lives, that they've experienced some kind of trauma, support them immediately. Don't make them wait for that set meeting that might be days, weeks, a month later. Support them right away and continue to support them. And then we also have to manage workloads. Um, now, I'm not going to ask you to comment on that one because you'll, you'll blow me up here, right? Because I know we are short-staffed everywhere and our workloads are being managed as best as we possibly can. And it's just, it's just something out there that um, we're having to find creative ways to diversify who's getting what and how we're managing those. And we're in a world where a lot of things are getting done virtually too. So it's, it's very different now, but we need to manage those workloads and we need to take into consideration that there could be some trauma histories that maybe I don't wanna give this worker this case based off of what they've had in their past. Um, let's talk about some of these symptoms real quick. So I wanna give you guys some things to, to look for within your staff. Some of these symptoms that we might see as adaptations within a, a staff member or ourselves. Um, how, many, how many workers have you seen that they would regularly show up on time or early and now they're coming in right on time or a few minutes late each day? Uh, what about taking longer to close a case than they normally would have? Uh, procrastinating, um, using more sick leave. Uh, avoiding having conversations with you or their coworkers, or avoiding conversations with their clients. What about burnout, negativity, hostility in the workplace? There's so many more things that are going on, right? Um, does burnout happen right away? It doesn't. It kind of builds up over time, and all of a sudden you you find that that straw that breaks the camel's back, and now you recognize that you're burnt out. It didn't happen from one case. It didn't happen from one situation. It built up. And that's the way a lot of this sneaks up and we start to have these symptoms that become adaptations. What caused it in the first place? What caused us to start doing these things that others are looking at as a problem? If I'm a supervisor and I have a worker who's doing these things and I now see this as a problem, Am I gonna treat them as a problem or am I gonna see this as potentially a symptom with that person who may need some help of their own and me just telling them that they're not doing good, that they need to do better, that's just not gonna help in some of these cases. Um, we already have high turnover rates in some areas and when we don't address some of those symptoms, when we don't see those adaptations as those things that we need to help with our workers as well, we oftentimes lose workers even more so. I want you guys to start thinking about having meaningful collaborative conversations with our staff. Give them some good structure, some good clear expectations and Make this trauma-informed approach part of your conversation every time you have that conversation, not just when you know that something has happened or that you've heard something's going on, every time. Um, we oftentimes say, hello, new worker. Here's the first part I want you to think about with your job. Go out and do all these things. 
And part of that is build rapport. How much time do we spend building rapport with our workers? I would venture a guess that you would say you spent more time doing that pre-COVID, pre-virtual telecommuting, remote work, whatever your organization's calling it. I would say you probably spent more time then than you do now. Uh, how many of you have workers that you've never met face to face before? Um, I know that we have. I know that uh, for well over a year now, all of our trainings have been taking place virtually. So I have people that I've only met once in person or never in person. That's a lot harder to start building some rapport that way too. So we need to make sure that we're building rapport, um, getting to know our staff, not just on that professional level, but also as that individual level. And of course, without crossing boundaries, we don't wanna cross any professional boundaries, but make sure that you are building that rapport with our workers. You see here that I have validate, validate, validate. Validation is a wonderful, wonderful tool. And I will say, since this is Tuesday, that validation, it goes just it goes together like tacos and Tuesday. You, you have to have one. You can't have one without the other. If you have something happening with somebody, it may not affect you, it may not bother you, but it may bother them. And you can't just say that if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother them or they're a professional and it shouldn't affect them. If it does, it does. And so validation acknowledges that their feelings are real to them, that their feelings are worthwhile, they're acceptable. And just as important it is to validate, it's important to make sure that we don't invalidate. And if we say things like, well, that's not that bad. That is probably one of the most invalidating statements you can ever make. And I've said it, I've said it to people. I've had things that have come up to me and I've said, well, it's not that bad. But if you bring it up and you have a gripe to make about that, is it not that bad to you? Of course it is. Even if it doesn't bother me, it's bothering you. So for me to say that, it invalidates. And when we invalidate people by saying things like that, we shut them down. We push them away. We push good employees away and we make them feel like their response, their feelings are not acceptable, they're unreasonable, or that there's no significance to those emotions that they're having right now. Um, I'm seeing a lot of your comments coming in and what if I have validation fatigue? I get tired. Validation is tough. It is. And validation has to be sincere. It, and, and that can be hard, especially when you're getting kind of tired of, of validating. Uh, I will say that if your validation is not coming out sincere or you're feeling tired by validating so much, it's probably not coming out the way that you would like it to anyway. And there are times that we have to admit to ourselves that we are fatigued by it. Um, just because we're a supervisor or in a management role or a leadership role doesn't mean we're impervious to these things. If anything, I would say that we're experiencing more, um, more of the secondary trauma or the vicarious trauma because we're not only hearing the one person's set, we're hearing everyone's and we're taking in parts of everyone's vicarious or secondary trauma. So you have to, you have to be doing some of this stuff for yourself at the same time too. Um, so some guiding questions while you're having these conversations. And again, I, I said sincere, everything on this slide has to be done sincerely. If it's not done sincerely, then your workers feel like it's not sincere and that it's just a, a checkbox on a piece of paper. So asking them things, what's their goal? Should they have goals? Yeah, they should have goals. What are they aspiring to do? What are they wanting to accomplish? Not just with the case that maybe they're conferencing with you about or whatever's happening that day, but where do they want to be a year from now? What kind of things do they want to see change in their career? Do we encourage them to reach those goals and enrichment activities and opportunities? Um, we need to. We need to make sure that they're setting goals. 
Uh, this isn't a resilience training, but I will tell you that one of the core components to resilience is having a, a sense of purpose. Have those goals that give you that sense of purpose and something to, to strive for. When you ask somebody what supports you need from me or how can I help, again, that has to be sincere and you have to follow through with it. It can't just be something where you a follow up, last minute question saying, um, well, how can I help you? Is there anything that I can do for you? You can say those things, but if you aren't coming across as sincere or you're not following through with those, then it just comes across as, okay, they say this every time, they check the box, they can tell somebody else that yes, they said that. So again, it has to be very sincere. Um, ask them, is there any workload or workplace issues concerning you? And again, let them be open to talking about that. They may not have had that support in the past. Maybe nobody asked that before. Ask it. Find out what kind of things are truly bothering them. And then again, validate, validate, validate. I can't stress the validation enough on this. Um, some trauma considerations. This is something for you guys to ask yourself starting right now. Do you know how that secondary trauma is already affecting your workforce? A lot of times your workers, they'll attempt to hide the fact that they're struggling with something. It could be that that's the culture of the workplace. Could be that they have personal traumas. It could be the tone set forth by a supervisor or even a generational or a cultural bias could be presented at that moment. And when you say, are you okay? Is everything going all right? What's going on with the job? They may say, everything's fine. When all truth be told, it's not. And that there's all these things that they have been guided to suppress, lie, cover it up, pretend, whatever you want to call it, it's been kind of the culture to say, no, there's no trauma affecting us, we're professional. Is there a chance that they were experiencing due to past experiences? How much do we truly know about each other? Our coworkers, our supervisors, they don't come with a medical write-up, a history, we don't have a, a system we can go in to see if we're receiving services. We don't have all those things that we, we sometimes get a little bit of a jump start with our clients. Our staff don't have those things. So how do we find out what kind of things they may have? How do we find out if they're re-experiencing? You may never know. So I'll go back to saying build that rapport. Make them feel like it is okay and that it is safe to tell you that, hey, I can't do this right now. I've got these things happening with me. Could they be feeling lost, hopeless, helpless? Um, I'll share, one of my friends' sister passed away last week. And if we're talking about re-experiencing due to past experiences and, and so on and so forth, a lot of places offer a bereavement leave. It may only be a few days, maybe five days. Does grief end at that point? doesn't. If somebody's experienced a trauma, does it only have a few days set time to say, okay, well, after this amount of time, you've, you've got to be able to move on, you're fine. That doesn't work either. And so we have to say, I don't know if they're still experiencing this. I don't know what they have in their past unless they've told me. And I'll go back to saying, treat it kind of like those universal precautions. If you don't know, you don't know. So let's pretend that everybody has a trauma history or has something that it could be affecting them in the job place. And then how do we support them? How do we get to them to say, I'm here, I want this to be safe, I want you to feel like you're supported. You gotta be aware of the language you use. One of the things that re-traumatizes faster than anything is our words. And it may not be traumatizing in the sense of you didn't just slap somebody or hit them or cause that exact same thing to happen to them again. But how often do we victim blame or victim shame? 
by saying things like, why didn't you just leave? You got into that house and they started yelling at you and threatening you. Why didn't you just leave? And then they got assaulted or something happened to them. Whose fault is it at that point the way you said that? You've just blamed them for what happened to them. Does that make it okay that they got injured, assaulted, whatever it may have been, just because they decided to stay? No, we're not trying to say that, but that's kind of how it comes across. Um, we hear that one a lot with domestic violence even. Why didn't you just leave? Um, another one I hear quite often is, didn't I tell you that would happen? Or you shouldn't have gone alone. You knew this could happen. And then my favorite that I hear all the time is, it's just part of the job. I'm going to need you to be fine and, and go do the next case. This is part of the job. You knew what you're getting yourself into. So how does how does that come across to the worker if we are saying that validation is important? If we're saying that part of that process of moving forward and becoming a safe environment is to say, I should validate and accept that they may have had some things happen, but we're basically saying, you're fine. Grab those bootstraps, pull them up, keep on going. You're fine. Um, yeah, I see you say the, we hear the phrase, I'm fine, it's fine, everything's fine. Yeah, we see that one a lot, don't we? Um, but it's, it's, it's important to know that, that everything's not fine. And it's okay to say that everything's not fine. We do want to have cultural responsiveness. Um, honor, respect, value, all that has to come into play when you're looking at cultural responsiveness. Are we going to have true and full insight into every person's culture? Not always. So if you can be respectful and be open to, to listen and to learn what that person's culture may say, do, that differs from yours, you might understand a little bit more about why they're doing some of the things that they're doing or feeling the way that they're feeling. So we have to be able to look at those beliefs, those traditions, and recognize that some things may be more normalized than others in certain cultures and less so in others. And then I want you to remember that trauma always equals loss. How many guys have heard that one before? Trauma always equals loss. That loss is not the same for everyone. Loss can take on many forms. For our staff, that, that loss is no different than for our clients. That loss could be loss of control, power, safety, trust, innocence. Um, think back on your careers. I would say that most of you are probably here um, as supervisors, maybe not all, and that's fine. Um, but if you're a supervisor, you've probably been in the field for a while. And ask yourself, can you remember the first case that you took or the first moment that you went into a, a situation that made you say, oh my gosh, it was just kind of mind blowing. You hadn't been in something like that before. And it was kind of shocking. But after a while, you kind of had more of those come along and they became less and less shocking and you became numb to that. Well, that is part of the process with how our brains try to protect us through trauma, through shock. Um, we start to dissociate some of that stuff. But did you lose something as you did that too? Part of that loss in that case could be that, that innocence, that ability to see the world in a lens that you don't have anymore. You have a different lens on now because you see things at a, a higher level. And you see that it's more prevalent than what most people do. So that loss can take on many forms, especially for our staff. At some point though, we have to start talking about healing our helpers. That's us, we're the helpers. We can't ignore those signs of compassion fatigue. And if you're not sure what compassion fatigue is, it's that, that emotional strain that comes from helping people. That's our job is to help people. Come to people on their time of need and try to help them as best we can. And it takes its toll on us. Uh, if if we were doing this training in person and you could see me, I'd, I'd show you my cup of give that I pour out to everybody. And then I would show you how much I fill it back up as I help someone. It's usually not filled up as much by that, that uh, satisfaction of helping someone as I gave out of it. So we have to find ways to build that resilience. Burnout happens. It's, it's, it's inevitable. Um, if anybody can say that they have never been burnt out in the job, um, I'd be willing to talk later and find out your secrets uh, because it, it happens to a lot of people. Uh, burnout's pretty common. 
And it doesn't have to be a permanent thing. It's not a, you get burnt out, you have to leave this job or it'll never get better. Burnout happens, you can come back from it. It happens in our staff and it happens in our leadership. And when it happens in our leadership, who sees that? Everyone sees that, right? Is it happening and as leadership, we try to hide that? As supervisors, we try to hide that. We try to be supportive for our staff. We do, we try, but does it come across a lot of times anyway? People see how you're affected, how you're speaking differently. They, they see that you're holding your body differently, whatever it may be, they can see that you're also experiencing that burnout too. And when you're experiencing that stuff as well, sometimes we can also inadvertently spread that to the people that we supervise or the teams that we oversee. We may have not meant to, but if we're feeling some kind of way about, say a policy, a statute, a certain case, uh, a change in leadership, a change in procedures, all kinds of things are happening these days. And if we're letting people see how that's bothering us, we can sometimes pass that on and make it part of the culture and part of what we, we encourage people to, to feel and do. We need to do all these things we're talking about for everybody, not just our employees, but the supervisors as well. From top down, side to side, everybody should be on board um, for this trauma-informed supervision and taking care of ourselves. One of the tools that I like to use, and it's free, one of the reasons I like it as well, is the ProQual, the Professional Quality of Life Scale. It's 30 questions, it's short and sweet, it gauges your compassion, satisfaction, burnout, and secondary trauma. Now, the ProQual is recommended to do about every 30 days. I, I honestly personally don't recommend every 30 days just because I know people get busy and, and you put too much on them to say you have to do this so often, they, they oftentimes don't do it at all. So my recommendation to people is that you do it once a quarter. Once every three months, do a check-in with yourself. And if you're a supervisor, this could be something, it's a, it's a tool that you could use with your, with your employees and their, their results are for their eyes only, not for ours as the supervisor. We have them fill this out just for them so that they can start to gauge their own levels of compassion, satisfaction, burnout, and, and secondary trauma. And then that kind of helps them see that maybe they need to do something to, uh, to remedy that. But with that being said, you as a supervisor should be doing it as well. If you are not doing it, but you're expecting them to do it, that's a bit hypocritical and you're not walking the walk anymore, and they'll pick up on that. They'll ask, and you wanna be able to honestly say, yeah, I, I did it, and this is what my scores turned out to be. Um, another thing that we can do to start that building process, to coming back from this, is team building. Now, I know team building gets a lot of hype, and when you, you say, let's do some team building, we start doing Google searches. We start doing all kinds of things to say, well, how do we do this team building right now? And what, what can we do as a retreat? It doesn't have to be a retreat. Uh, I'll tell you, a few months back, uh, we allowed some of our workers to come in for a training live and they hadn't seen each other uh, for well over a year. And I saw a couple of them shed a few tears. And when I checked on them, they're like, oh no, these are happy tears. I haven't seen them in so long. I like working from home, but I miss seeing my coworkers. I miss seeing my friends. So getting people together is team building. It doesn't have to be something elaborate. It doesn't have to be this, this big ropes course that we're gonna do. If we're having meetings that are completely focused on the job and there's no downtime for them to chit chat, go stand by the water cooler, bond, we're missing an opportunity for team building without even having to call it that. When they come together like that, they, they bond. And it's validating and healing to them to hear that other people are going through the same kinds of things. And then it's also healing to hear that they've been through it and this is what they did. Now you have a new tool. Now you have the strength in numbers that you're not the only one experiencing some of these things and it becomes safer to talk about it and a lot of times too, our coworkers will talk to each other before they'll talk to the supervisor because there's that one level of, of leadership 
that caused them to go, I don't want to talk to them about it because what if they say I need to do this and it's not safe to just vent. So they can vent to each other and feel safer doing that. I'll tell you that we need to celebrate successes, not just the big ones. Celebrate all successes, even the small ones. Sometimes those small successes are the only ones that we have. You can't wait for the big ones to come out to celebrate. Celebrate those small successes and wins from each one of your employees. I will also tell you, don't skimp on your employees' needs for training and development needs or your own. I mean, you guys are here today, so that's, that's promising. That makes me feel great that you're already on board for that training and development needs. And it's so vital. We need to have that professional and personal growth continuously taking place. And we want to encourage our employees to to grow, even if that means they will eventually outgrow us and leave. Some of you might be like, well, what if I put all this time and energy into training somebody and then they leave me after I've done that? Pat yourself on the back because you have just succeeded as a supervisor, as a leader, as a mentor. If somebody can do something to better their lives, encourage that, even if it means they leave you. Now on the flip side of that, what if you don't provide them with all those meaningful opportunities for growth and development and they don't grow and get better in their job and they stay? And you're left with people who maybe aren't doing as good of a job as they could have been had we put the emphasis on that. So it's a win-win either way you look at it, even if they outgrow us. Another area that is getting overlooked a little more these days is networking. It's just tougher in a lot of ways now because we're in a much more virtual environment, but there are still opportunities for networking. Uh, Krista talked about some earlier with the peer-to-peer -peer phone calls, the, the check-ins there. It's a perfect opportunity to hear what other people have going on all around the country. Uh, a great way to, to network. It provides that growth. It provides validation for workers everywhere to hear that, you know, what they're experiencing, what they're going through isn't just with them, that it is happening other places, and that they're not feeling foolish or unreasonable for thinking or feeling a certain way, and they're getting feedback from others. It does help out our clients too. This improves efficiency. If we're networking and hearing about resources and we're hearing about all these things that make our job easier, that's a win-win too. All right, let's talk about some buzzwords. So right now, the world has put a much larger emphasis on that first bullet point, self-care. And I put it in there, yeah, we say that. When we have our meetings with our employees, when we have our department-wide, division-wide, statewide meetings, get-togethers, town hall meetings, we say, you guys need to practice self-care. And it has become a buzzword. And when we make it just a buzzword, what are you actually encouraging? So if I have a meeting with somebody and I say, it sounds like you're, you're stressed out quite a bit right now, what are you doing for self-care? And they go, well, I'm doing it. Or I just say, you should be practicing self-care. Is that good enough? We might be encouraging it, but we're not really doing anything beyond, beyond that. So what can we do? We can encourage people to take time off. We can encourage people to pursue resources. We can encourage all kinds of things for self-care. And we need to actually be putting a, a focus on that to encourage what does that actually look like for that person. Um, we tell people to take time off. Yeah, we encourage that, but do we really? Do we really encourage people to take that time off and mean it? Or do we say, take the time off if you need it, your work's gonna be here when you get back, and there's gonna be a lot more of it. And it's almost like a, a, a threat, if you will. Like, if you take time off, you know when you get back, it's just gonna be worse, so you better just stay. That's tough, right? That makes it tough to even say, I wanna take a day off. Uh, I asked some employees a while back, if I were to offer a training, opportunity to where you could come live and socially distance and stay within all the guidelines, would you come and would you feel it's beneficial? 
I had some say that they want the training, they want that opportunity to learn some new things, but they couldn't afford to take the time away from their desk for a couple of hours because they would get that far behind. Well, as supervisors, we need to be encouraging that that work, yes, it will be there when they get back, but we need to make sure that we're not saying it as like a threat, that we're also saying, yes, it will be there, but you're important too. And that's probably the biggest part of it that we have to make them feel like they're important too. We need to prioritize personal time. Yeah, we try to do that. Same thing. We say it, but are we really doing it? And then we also tell people, well, your time is your time unless you're on call or if I need you or whenever something happens and, and you know, that day off that I told you you could have, I'd really rather you came into work. So, but your time is your time. If you have leave and you need to take leave, take that leave, but I don't really mean it. So we need to make sure again that we are making that a priority for our employees and that we truly do mean that. Uh, let me ask this question. How many of you have the access to and do check your work emails from your personal cell phones when you're off duty at home? I'll wait a second to, to see some of the responses in here. Yeah, I'm seeing some people say, yep, they do. Yeah, every day. Uh, you guys, me too. Um, not as much these days, but I have had the opportunity to look at my work email, and I've had times that I have picked up my phone, and without even thinking, I hit the button that goes to my work email, and now I'm looking at work emails at like 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge, huge advocate for resiliency and self-care. If you're checking your work emails at home, you're not practicing the best self-care that you could be practicing because your time is your time. And I'm not saying that as a buzzword. I mean it. Your time is your time. I did a training in um, Springfield, Missouri not too long ago, and I was doing a resilience and secondary trauma training. And when I got done with this training, the supervisor for this department that I was uh, working with stood up and looked around at everybody and said, how many of you have access to your work email on your personal phones? And they all raised their hands. And the supervisor said, take out your phones right now, delete them, delete it. A couple of people wanted to say, but, and before they could even give out their excuse on why they didn't want to do it, she said, no. I'm not taking any butts on this one. If you have reason to be checking your emails and working on things after hours, you have a work issued cell phone. And even with that one, I don't want you checking it unless you have to. So now everybody take out your phone and delete that app, delete that link from your personal cell phones. Uh, it, was, it was so rewarding to me to see that she had heard the message in that training and wanted to take that first step to say, you have to do something about this. Um, now, I didn't say it. I didn't say checking your work emails and all that stuff. I was just doing the training, and it came out in her mind to say, I should say something about this because I know they're doing it. And she did it too, and she's like, I'm deleting it right now. And she led by example. She pulled out her phone first and deleted it and showed everybody she did it. So don't be afraid to lead by example. Um, EAP. Employee assistance programs. I would say that uh, most everybody in here's organization has some sort of employee assistance program. And we encourage them. Of course we do. And we tell people, don't be afraid to use it. Of course we do. But do we really mean that sometimes? And are our employees comfortable using the EAP without fear that there's some kind of stigma attached with that um, or judgment? or some kind of uh, forced therapy that there's some coercion involved. And as supervisors, are we using it? If we have issues going on and we need to utilize it, then absolutely we need to utilize it. And if they ask, well, do you use it? Be honest with them. You don't have to tell them your issues, just like they may not wanna tell you their issues. 
but be honest and be open about the experience. I've, for many years, you heard Krista say that I've been with the state of Missouri. Um, I actually just celebrated 19 years this month. For 19 years, from day one, I've heard people talk about our employee assistance program, but that you better not use it because they will shun you for it. That's not true. It is not true, but there is this stigma attached with it that if you use it, there will be something, some kind of retaliation with that, some kind of, some kind of coercion, something's gonna happen to say, yeah, we, we, um, if you're damaged that much, you probably shouldn't be doing this. And that's the message that gets sent across. So we need to normalize it. And then the last one on here is staff appreciation. Yeah, we do that too. But how do we do it? How are we appreciating staff? Are we doing it just to say we're doing it? Or are we doing it as a constant and a sincere appreciation? You know, it's one thing to have a planned event where we're doing an appreciation thing, and it only happens once a year, once every six months. If we're doing that, that's great. We should do it as often as we can, but are we being sincere where we appreciate our staff on an individual level even? Remember I said earlier, we need to celebrate those successes. Sometimes those small successes are the only ones we have. Take that opportunity to show that appreciation. It doesn't have to be something as elaborate as a big party or an employee of the month. Share that appreciation of someone, a little thank you, a sincere thank you goes a long way. Um, and I hear people say, well, can you overuse it? I honestly don't think you can unless you're only saying the words thank you to say them and they're not coming out sincere. If they're sincere, they're meaningful. So make sure that you are doing that appreciation for your staff. Now I say all this and I use these buzz buzzwords like that to say it's a culture change, you guys. It is a culture change. Just saying it doesn't make it happen. Just attending this, this um, training today doesn't mean it's gonna happen for you. You actually have to do something about it. And trauma-informed care alone is pretty new to people. Uh, some of you guys said that you're in the early stages. That's new enough, right? But now to think about, well, now we're also going to take this whole extra level of it to our staff and not just our clients and say, all right, we're going to change the culture here. Trauma-informed care in itself is a culture change. Making it about our, our staff as well as our clients is an even bigger culture change. Some of our organizations have been around for a really long time, and they've got this culture that has been passed down from generation to generation. Uh, many of us have been supervised, quote unquote, old school, right? People say things like, you knew the risks involved with this. You knew what you were getting yourself into. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You need to harden yourself. You can't be affected by this stuff. Don't feel so much about your cases. Don't feel into them. You need to toughen your skin. And if you can't handle this, get out. That's kind of been the mentality that has been shared for a long time from a lot of places. And we got to get better at saying being affected by trauma is going to happen, and that's okay, and I want to help you. So say it, mean it, do it, and keep doing it. So often our, our best efforts get started, and we say it, and we mean it, and we do it. But it's not easy. And so since it's not easy and that culture is not changing overnight, we kind of go, okay, well, you know what? This isn't, um, this isn't happening because I'd like. Let's just do things the way that we always did it because they were working. But they weren't really working the way that we really wanted them to. And we weren't appreciating and supporting our staff the way that we really wanted to. So perseverance is going to be the name of the game. Start it. Say it. Mean it. Do it. Keep doing it. Can't give up. Get to know your staff, build that rapport. We get stuck thinking that we need to supervise the way that we were supervised. And that's a tough one. That's a tough one sometimes. We, we get stuck in this mindset that, you know, this wasn't the way I was raised in the system. This wasn't the way that I was supervised. This wasn't the way that I got trained on it. I'm gonna train you and I'm gonna teach you the way that I got it and how I was successful with it. And when somebody comes and says, this is bothering me, you go, no, we don't talk about that. We don't, we don't do that. We need to make sure that we're letting go of what we may have had in our past and moving forward. We may have our own 
generational or trauma or secondary trauma, all these other things that have happened to us in our jobs, in our lives, and we're now perpetuating that to the next generation of staff. We need to make sure that we're drawing a line somewhere and saying from here forward, we're going to do better. Don't assume that your staff that you consider to be tough are as tough as you consider them to be because of what we just said with that generational um, perpetuated toughness that we've passed down. Um, I hear people say, oh, that was so-and-so that took that case, that that happened to. They're, they're tough. They're good. They've been doing this a long time. This, we don't need to worry about them. And that's not true. Um, trauma doesn't affect the same way twice, doesn't affect the same way for two different people. And it may not affect me the first time, the first 20 times, but at some point it may. And if somebody just assumes the entire time that I'm tough and I can handle it and I can work through it and it's not going to affect me, you're going to miss out on that. And once it's happened, there's always that chance that it could happen some more. And if we're ignoring that, we're not supporting our staff. Um, I will tell you that one way that you can help with this is implementing some kind of critical incident policy, some kind of some kind of structure that ensures that there will be consistency from worker to worker, incident to incident, because again, no two times might be the same and no two workers may experience it the same. This way you can kind of spell out what kind of events you're looking for. It's going to help guide the supervisors so that one supervisor is not checking on something that somebody else isn't and you're not leaving it up to a judgment call. Um, make sure that we're allowing people to kind of show that vulnerability when things are happening and that it is safe to say, yeah, this shook me up pretty good and I don't really know where I'm going from here. We need to make sure that we're also paying attention to how many exposures people are having to certain types of traumas, certain types of incidents. Um, pay attention to their burnout, their compassion fatigue. And know that because of that buildup of compassion fatigue and burnout, they may now be experiencing trauma that they may not have experienced before or having some of those effects um, that are translating into their work and into their personal lives. The next piece to this is the normalizing piece. Making sure that you're saying to them, it's okay to say you need help. It's okay to say that this bothered you. Truly, truly encourage people to do self-care. Do activities with your staff. When you're having some of these, these team building activities or your supervision meetings with people, find out the things that they in, enjoy doing. Uh, earlier, I saw somebody put in the chat box camping. I'll tell you that my biggest resilience building thing that I can do for myself is getting outside. Nature heals me. Doesn't matter what I'm doing out there. If I can go outside and spend some time there, it does help me uh, start to work through some things and kind of bounce back. Find out what it is for your staff and encourage that. Encourage their self-care. Part of that's also going to be encouraging to take those days off, to take that personal leave. Check on your employees as often as you can. Again, don't make it a set time that they have to wait for things. Check on them regularly. Another thing that I'll tell you along with that is following up more than once. When something happens, so often we say, oh, I heard about this. Let me check on them. And you check on them immediately, and that's great. And that person says, I'm okay. I'm fine. It's fine. Everything's fine, right? But that first moment, you should absolutely check on them, but you should also recognize that in that first moment, they may be in a state of shock. They may have put up some walls to say, I have to tell you that I'm okay because I don't want you forcing me to take time off. I don't want you telling me I have to call EAP. I'm, I don't want you doing these things or I don't want to appear weak. And again, if it's any one of those reasons, they may not say anything other than I'm fine. Check on them again in three days. Check on them again in five days. Put that in part of your, your policy that you're going to write or whatever it may be. Put some parameters in there to say that we won't just leave somebody to the wayside even though we've asked them once. Check on them more than once and not just in the same day. Have some good follow through with that. Encourage resources outside of the workplace employee assistance program because, again, even though we are talking about normalizing it and we're talking about changing that culture, there's still a lot of stigma attached to that. 
And the lucky thing for us now is that we live in a day and age where there are resources aplenty um, for staff to utilize. Workshops that we could send them to, trainings we could send them to. There are all kinds of apps out there that are free of charge that can provide them an outlet for um, trained listeners, um, therapy, counseling, um, and, and they're free, at least to start. So there's lots of things out there outside of the Workplace Employee Assistance Program. Encourage those. And they may feel safer to start with those and then eventually wind up using their, their EAP. Give them ongoing training and awareness of secondary trauma. What those effects are, how to recognize that they're being affected by it, some of those symptoms that we take home with us even, and then give them some coping strategies. And the last one on here is peer support teams. I will tell you that peer support teams are a awesome, awesome tool. They do provide proven, viable, and meaningful support services that help with the general well-being of our staff. The peer support team that we have here in Missouri, um, we, we have it called CAST. It's a crisis assistance support team. It is made up of volunteers, and that's the way most of these peer support teams are made up. It's people who want to help. And lucky for us, we're in that business. We have no shortage of people who want to help. But we want people who want to help their coworkers and have that sense of, of confidentiality, confidentiality about them too, because we want this to be safe. Our employees need to have an opportunity to talk and vent outside of with us as their supervisor. They need to have that safe place where it's a peer. Even if that peer is not someone they truly know, if they know that they're being able to talk to somebody who has has walked the walk, who has been in their shoes or has been in similar situations, they know that that can offer up some empathy and validation. And I'll talk more about that here in just a second. But we want to provide them with that, that trusting environment where they know that they can say those things without fear of it being sent back to their supervisor to any leadership. Because again, they'll just shut down at that point and they won't want to say things. Um, when I said those who are currently walking the walk, they've been in their shoes. As a supervisor, there's probably a pretty good chance that you have done the work of those that you are supervising. I won't say 100% because there are some times that we wind up in roles where we're supervising people that maybe we haven't done their job before. But in a lot of cases, we have. And we say to our employees, hey, I wouldn't ask you to do anything that I myself haven't done or wouldn't do. And that's probably true. That's probably true in almost every case, except for there is this one piece where our employees that we're supervising, there's a good chance that they have come into our supervision since we have been out of that role and they have never seen us in that role. And if they've never seen us in that role, we're expecting them to just take our word for it, that we have been in those shoes and we used to walk that walk. And I'm not asking you to do anything that I wouldn't do. One thing that has happened here um, with this pandemic is we've had more people have to step up to the plate and take on roles that maybe they had previously been in or new roles that they've never been in to help out with that, that shortage that we may be having. And I can tell you from seeing some of our, our feedback from a lot of different surveys that have been out there, it has not gone unnoticed by those that you supervise. And it's probably one of the best things that you could have ever done is to show them that you are also willing to do those things and to pitch in where you can and for them to see that you're also um, walking that walk and that you've probably also struggled walking that walk at the same time that they have because it's it's still a tough job. So don't forget that. Don't forget that you might need to show them that you can help and that you have done things and don't be afraid to to get back into those shoes and walk that walk again. Now, I said that I would also talk about that peer support um, within offering empathy and validation. I want you guys to kind of remember that empathy is, is that art of feeling into what someone else might be experiencing, their feelings. You're imagining what they might be going through. You're imagining it, so you might not be imagining it correctly. But that empathy where you're imagining it and you're trying to feel into what they have, that's what leads you to good validation. And that validation is when you're going to acknowledge and accept that what they're feeling is valid and reasonable and real to them, regardless of what you might be feeling personally or what you may have even imagined it might be being. So when you validate, you give them the opportunity to say, yeah, that's exactly 
how I'm feeling and thank you for acknowledging that. Or it may come across as, you know, that's not how I feel at all. And that gives you that opportunity to then develop more empathy and lead into better validation. Uh, so again, tacos and Tuesdays, you have to have one with the other. It helps, it helps you develop better validation when you can think about that as an empathy coming across too. And then you guys, we're gonna talk about you. As the supervisor, you're not immune. Don't ignore yourself. If you're telling staff that you have to take care of yourself, that they need to follow through with doing some employee assistance, if we're encouraging them to reach out to that peer support team, if we're encouraging any of these things and we're saying, take your time off, if we're not also doing it as a supervisor, we are not modeling the appropriate behaviors or that appropriate level of self-care. So we also need to do those things. And we also need to do those things because you're going to experience all of your employees' secondary trauma, not just one person's. So while each one of our employees is experiencing secondary trauma from the things that they're encountering with their jobs, and you're hearing about all those as you talk about them, you're experiencing every one of your employees. So it builds up with us as well. Even if we're not leaving our desk to go out and see these things, you're still hearing about it. And trauma doesn't care who you are. And our brains store trauma as trauma, whether it was happening to us firsthand or if it's secondary trauma. So it builds up and it builds up over time. Make a plan for your own self-care. Walk the walk, offer that peer-to-peer -peer support, give and be open to receiving feedback often. Do it as often as you can and let it be okay for them to give you feedback. Ask for it, look for it. Um, ask them if you've been giving the right kind of help and make it okay if they say no. Um, be consistent. Be consistent be transparent and give it time. This is not going to be a one and done thing, you guys. Um, to become trauma-informed as an organization, to truly become trauma-informed, it's, it's a multiple years project. So to say that becoming good at trauma-informed supervision would take less time wouldn't be necessarily reasonable, but you can do both at the same time. And be reasonable with yourself on how much time that is going to take. Don't give up. It's not easy, but it is worth it. And I want to touch on consistency and transparency again. Earlier, I said that one of those core things was trust. How easy is it for us to burn through that level of trust with our employees by not being consistent or transparent? Think about it from your, your line of supervision that you're in. Everybody's got a supervisor. What happens when your supervisor is not consistent or transparent with you or flat out lies about something that they may have known about? It breaks a level of trust and that's gonna make it take even longer to change that culture, to make it a normalized experience. Now I know that there are things that take place behind the scenes. I'm privy to a lot of those myself and people ask me all the time, what do you know about this? I may know some things about it. And I may also know that there are things that I cannot share because they are not finalized things. But there's usually a level of something that you can share, remain consistent with it, and be transparent. And build that trust by doing that. Trust is so vital when we start talking about trauma-informed supervision. If they don't feel like they can trust you, they're not going to share and they're not going to open up enough to truly get into the weeds of trauma-informed supervision. All right, I told Krista that I would be done by 3.15 to give you guys time for questions, and I beat that mark by a few minutes, so <laughs> here we are. <laughs> thank you, Robin. My goodness, thank you so much. That was such great, great and timely information, and thank you, all of you, for participating so much in the questions. It's been excellent seeing everything come in. I and agree. That was awesome. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I'm going to start with a couple that have come in uh, during the your presentation, Robin. But please, if you have any other questions that have come up for you or any comments, keep um, keep typing into the questions box. So um, this is one um, that um, 
I wanted to touch on, and maybe this is, is more appropriate for folks at a higher level than supervisor, but do you ever recommend a program-wide anonymous deployment of the pro QOL to gauge how the program is as a whole or um, to track the impact of large initiatives? And so this kind of speaks to the supervisors also having to make sure that um, they're being supported. Um, I have mixed feelings on that, to be honest with you. Okay. I think when we, we send out these mass things asking people to give honest feedback about where they're at or what the place is like, we, we, we wind up with that, that paranoia where somebody's like, well, they're tracking this and I don't want to give honest feedback. That being said, though, if you can and do have a, a system that it does allow them to have that anonymity to, to say that nobody will know who you are, then yeah, I think it's a great way uh, to gather that information and see where you might need to go forward with. Uh, now, the ProQual is designed to be an individual thing that is um, for their eyes only, but you could probably adapt something and turn it into a, a worksite wellness type event or a worksite um, survey to, ga to gauge some of that. So yeah, I, I think that'd be great if you can do it with a, with a sense of uh, them being able to be anonymous. Great, thanks. Um, and then you had a lot of uh, tips for healing the helper, but do you have any anything else to say about someone recovering from burnout without leaving the job or position that they're currently in? That's going to be kind of an individual thing um, okay. without talking to the person individually about what's really truly causing that burnout and what they're experiencing is kind of hard to answer. Mm -hmm. um, for each person, it may be a, a question they have to ask themselves. Can they move forward from the things that really got to them? What would be the healing factor? Who needs to be a part of that? Because oftentimes if you're burnt out from something and you're not wanting to leave, there's other people involved or other things involved too. Um, but I'm also, I'm a huge advocate for if, if you've met the end of your career in the particular role, it's okay to move on to something else. And if you can stay with the same agency or, or maybe move laterally, that's great too. And that might be all it takes to kind of bounce back for a while and then come back to what you may have known and loved. Great. Thanks so much. And then I'll just answer this uh, question really quickly. Yes, the presentation was recorded. So um, I know some of you were having some bandwidth issues, so um, you can hear an uninterrupted recording. We'll post that in the next few weeks and let you know. Um, how does a supervisor guard against becoming a therapist during supervision, especially if that isn't in their own skill set? That's a great question. Um, and it's tough sometimes. Uh, it, you don't want to become that therapist um, because, again, I, I said earlier, you know, you get to know your staff, but stay within those professional boundaries. And if it seems as though somebody's starting to open up and share too much and it starts to feel like a therapy session, at that point, I would say it's probably appropriate to refer them either to potentially a peer support team if you have one that, that could adequately address it. If not, it may be time to encourage the employee assistance program or some of those other resources that maybe you can find to put in place. Um, and don't be afraid to um, not necessarily draw a line in the sand, but have a certain point where you might say, okay, I, I'm, I'm hearing this and I'm concerned. And because I'm concerned that I don't want to cross any boundaries that I shouldn't cross, and I wanna make sure that you're taken care of, here's some resources, but please feel free to continue to talk to me and check in with me or I'll check in with you so that you're still getting the professionalism out of it and you're getting them the, the help that they need without you feeling like you're outside of your own comfort wheel. Great, thank you. All right, one of these uh, upper level management uh, <laughs> questions. So what can you do when upper level management are old school? and don't genuinely support trauma-informed approaches or even talking about self-care? Well, that's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it makes it a lot harder. Uh, you have to start with buy-in. Uh, if, you, if your upper, upper level doesn't buy in, it makes it a lot harder to pass that on. It doesn't make it impossible, um, but if you can get them to buy into some parts of it and start somewhere, uh, if you can get them to see some of the benefits, a lot of times for the people that I've, I've encountered that I've bumped heads with, 
once they see some of the benefits, they start to come around and, and maybe not fully because they are kind of that old school, but maybe not fully, but maybe they start to come around to some of those pieces and that starts to change it some. Uh, but that's a tough one. And this question came in um, earlier in the, um, in the presentation, which is kind of the flip side of that, which might be difficult to answer as well, is, is advice on how to tell our supervisors that our staff need support when they do seem to understand trauma-informed supervision, but there may not be movement. Um, I think if they are supportive of it, then half the battle's already done. It may just be almost becoming that broken record yourself, but showing them, uh, giving them some realistic and and real life situations that will kind of hammer home what it is you're talking about and not just saying it out loud. Again, kind of goes, it goes back to that buzzword thing. If they're hearing it, but they're not having anything to truly quantify it to something, it makes it harder for them to want to keep pushing forward. So have some real life examples to give and and try to encourage things. And if you can, and you have the ability to take the lead on some of those things and you're willing to make that change, put that out there too. Um, but having that open and honest conversations and communication with them will, will be what the driving force is. Great, thank you. Um, and I believe this might be coming from a field perspective. How do you relay burnout without sounding like a broken record since nothing is changing? How do you ask for EAP? Do you feel comfortable tackling that one? Um, I think part of that question would be better served talking with your own level of supervision and supervisor, speaking of trauma-informed supervision, because I don't know how your EAP may work. I know for a lot of them, they don't have to ask for it. They can just utilize it whenever they want. Um, but I think that first part of it, how do you relay that burnout without sounding like a bro broken record? Um, if your first approach didn't work the way you wanted it to, you may have to take a different approach. And again, it's a lot of it is, is open, honest conversations with people um, and asking for that, um, that openness to be received from the other end too. Great, thank you. Um, here's another difficult one, and you, you welcome you to, to punt on this if, if <laughs> you would like to. Um, so if you have upper management, um, an upper management person that caused trauma and the director or high level person has said staff need to move on and get over it, um, how, how do you recommend handling this? Well, that is one that you are right. That's tough. You guys are full of tough questions this afternoon. <laughs> um, that's one that I hate punting questions, but I may have to punt that one to your local human resources. <laughs> that but, is very fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very fair. All righty. Um, I think we had one other question that was a, that was related, but a, a little maybe been out maybe out of your wheelhouse a little bit. So I decided to ask you and, and I will let you punt on this one if it, <laughs> if you would like as well. Um, so this person is relaying that there is an increase in mental uh, cases involving mental health um, issues and um, this, this um, relays back to discussions around safety. Um, and a concern about being physically attacked either by clients or alleged perpetrators or others. Um, do you have any recommendations for um, safety? So worker safety, supervisor safety, um, or would you redirect this person to speaking with their direct supervision? I would probably say start talking with your leadership. Okay. I know a lot of states are looking at what kind of things can we put in place now for safety and Mm -hmm. um, that's a, it's a great conversation to start having. Great, thank you. Okay, I think that might um, be, that is it for questions. Um, so we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Robin. Um, Robin and I have been working on this one for a while and I, we, we, were, we were both so excited to bring it to y'all. Um, it was very, very well received and um, 
obviously we we need to keep working on this in the field and supporting our supervisors. So thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank um, our TARC team and Andy Capehart. Um, and thank you, everyone, for um, being so engaged. It was it was wonderful. So we hope to see you for the next APS TARC webinar for the greater APS field on March 15th. And the topic is going to be equity and cultural humility in APS with perspectives from APS legal and behavioral health. And we are confirming our presenters as we speak. Um, so watch out for registration coming in February. And please enjoy the rest of your day and see you next time and uh, take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kristen.